Well, a good evening to all. We thank God. Good evening to all. We are truly thankful for this opportunity that we can come and study God's Word. We are looking this evening at preparing a Bible study as we progress in seeking to understand how God would make us effective ministers of the gospel. Volume, volume. So, it is good to see all of you here as usual, and uh, it is evident that God really is preparing a people to learn what it means to study his word. So, as I had mentioned sometime past, there is more, before we pray, there is more to giving a Bible, preparing a Bible study than putting scripture together. You know, we can often find ourselves just... Okay, we have to do a Bible study, or we have to do a message, and uh, what we do is uh, we seek to put together passages of Scripture so that we can share something. And a Bible study is not just for the purpose of putting together Scripture. A Bible study is really, we should perceive it as God's voice speaking to us personally, and we are sharing God's voice with others. And uh, there is not only a transmission then of information, but an invitation to relationship. Not just a transmission of information, but an invitation to relation. We want to have a relationship with God. So the Bible study then is a revelation that God has a desire to communicate with us. You know, we had studied a little while back, John chapter 1 verse 1, where it says that in the beginning was the... Uh, Word And the word there is uh, the expression of a thought. And the expression of a thought is communication. In the beginning, there was communication. So when we are putting together Bible study, that is one thing that we should keep in mind, that God is seeking to, and God's desire is to communicate with us as uh, he wants to communicate with others. God's desire is to touch people that they in turn will touch others to touch. So we are not just to be touched, but we are to touch people and teach them how to touch others. Not just transmitting information, but teaching people how to build relationships through Bible study. That is what we are going to be looking at this evening. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me even as we begin. Let us pray. Father in heaven and merciful God, we are truly thankful and grateful to you for this opportunity that we together here in this assembly and even online through cyberspace can come together and study your word. And we are looking forward to receiving a word from you. Bless us at this time, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. So, as we had said, we are looking to teach individuals how to teach. We don't just want to teach, but these sessions are to teach you how to teach others. And before we get into that, we are going to look at the very dynamics of what it means to learn where God is concerned. You know, Paul told Timothy, he mentioned to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall teach others, or who shall be able to teach others also. So that is really the hallmark of uh, through ministry. You are not seeking to teach. What you are doing is seeking people, you are seeking to teach people how to teach others because you want the knowledge of God to grow exponentially and to go from one to another. So we not only want to teach, but to teach also how to teach. And therefore, after Bible study then, the lives of people should be so changed that they are never the same again. I just had a, recently, I had a Bible study with a, a lady, and she came to my home actually. And, and the thing is, she, when, it was a short Bible study, and when she left, she says, my life has changed. Not just a transmitting of information, but she felt different in herself. She felt as though the information received had so impacted her life that 
her life would never be the same again. With this additional knowledge, she was able to go and uh, share with others. You would remember the lady that Christ met in Samaria. She was by a Samaritan, uh, by, she was a Samaritan and she was by the well. And Christ, he saw her, as it were, in vision. And he went to her. He sat there by the well. He was waiting. And then this lady came and uh, he asked her a favor. But he really wanted to transmit something to her. But rather than saying, I have something for you, what did he say? I want you to do something for me. So oftentimes when you make yourself vulnerable to individuals, you are placing yourself in a position where you can really teach them. Because if you can make yourself vulnerable to a person, it is there that you can build confidence. It is there that you can build rapport. It is there that you can build trust so that you'll be able to impart. So when Christ opened up himself, demonstrated his need to the lady, she says, how come you being a Jew as a woman of Samaria to give you a drink? You should not be really speaking to us. She saw something different in this man. And therefore, her heart was open to him that he, unlike so many of the leaders in Israel, he was able to tell her exactly who he was. He says, uh, she says, Messiah will come. He says, I that speak unto thee am he. he. He didn't usually tell people that openly, but this woman of Samaria who had five husbands, living with a man that was not her husband, and uh, she was just not seen to be a woman of, uh, a reputable woman in the society, he was able to open up to this woman in such a way that he was not able to open up to any other. So it is telling us that we are not therefore to cast people away because of their background. We are to deal with, with people who they are, and sometimes some of those individuals who seem to be the, the, the least ones that will be primed to give a Bible study. They may be the ones that are really needing that Bible study and may carry it further. This lady brought a whole village to Christ. But the thing is about her, she did not realize how much influence she had. You know, we don't understand our influence. When we are touched by Christ, when we receive a revelation of Christ, when it has impacted our lives and we give, give our testimony, you would be surprised how the hearts of individuals are moved. Each one of us in here has influence. We all have influence. And the influence then that we have is for the purpose of bringing people to a saving knowledge of the truth. So, Studying the scriptures then is not merely, or giving a Bible study is not merely to transmit information or to share our doctrines. It is for edification. When you study, it should be for your own personal edification. You should be receiving something. As a matter of fact, we are told in 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 15, the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy said, and that from a child thou has known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the scriptures are designed to make us wise unto salvation. And the more we spend time in scripture, the wiser we will become. He then says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So notice that the scriptures, they're for doctrine and people stay there. But it is not only for doctrine, it is for what? Reproof. Hands of those who like reproof. We don't like reproof. But that is what the scriptures are for. The scriptures are to reprove us when we are going in the wrong direction. They are to instruct us. They are to correct us. And uh, many of us, we don't like to be corrected. But that is what the scriptures are for. That is what giving a Bible study oftentimes is for. And therefore, you are not just trying to sell your religion. You're not just trying to sell your doctrine. You're trying to meet people where they are and try to bring them, take their hands and put their hands in the hands of Jesus Christ. That is why he says in verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So studying the scripture then like ignites within us Deep within us, a desire to share with others. If you don't have a desire to share with others, it therefore demonstrates something about your studying of the scriptures. I can remember that 
I was very young in the faith, and I had this insatiable desire to study and to know. But the more I get to know, the greater my desire to impart that which I know, as shy as I was, and the more I imparted that which I know, the more, the greater the desire to get to know more. You see? So the more that I knew, then I had a desire to get to know more. And, uh, you know, I, I've come to realize that a lot of people don't realize what their gifts really are. Some people may say, well, I don't have a gift for giving Bible studies. I don't have the gift for teaching or for preaching. As long as you have a voice and as long as you can speak, that is the gift of speech. You have the gift of giving a Bible study. You get that? Ravinia? <laughs> as long as you have the gift of speech, you have the gift of giving a Bible study. Every single person can give a Bible study. Everybody. Everyone. So if you can speak and if you are reading the scriptures, it therefore means that God has endowed you with the gift of giving a Bible study. You may not be able to give a Bible study like Dr. Greenwich. You may not be able to give a Bible study like St. Mary. But the reality is that every single one of us can give a Bible study at the level of which we are at. We have to look for opportunities. As a matter of fact, let me, let me rephrase that. If you are being prepared... If you are preparing yourself, you don't have to look for an opportunity. The opportunity will come. Praise the Lord. Therefore, if you are reading and if you are studying, God will open up and you are preparing. One person says it's better to, pre to be prepared for an opportunity that does not come than for the opportunity to come and you're not prepared. So be prepared. That is his house motto. Be, be, be prepared. Prepare yourself on a daily basis and uh, think within your mind, God will have for me to interact with some person today. You may not have to go and preach a sermon at the church, but you may meet one person. It may be a child. It may be a man or a woman. And you can share with that person a Bible study. Even your devotion that you've done in the morning, you can say, Lord, this is something that I want to impart. We have been using the internet a lot but we want to be able to face to face communicate with people that means that we have to intermingle ourselves with individuals wherever we if you go out to work you're not just going out to work to make money you're going out to work for the purpose of impacting the lives of others to show people what god is all about we are in what is called the antitypical day of atonement and in the antitypical day of atonement people did not work on that day they did not do things to earn their living. We have to come to understand that in this day of atonement, antitypical day of atonement, we are here for a purpose of beseeching the throne of God for the coming of Christ and also to impart knowledge to others. So all are given gifts. Look at this. It say, it, this is seen in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto... Only males? No. He gave gifts unto humanity, Sister Leach. That is right. So he gave gifts to men and to women. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see a number of gifts there that everybody, well, you have the gifts of help, you have the gifts of administration, you have the gifts, all types of gifts are mentioned there. But there's also something that is called the, the leadership gifts. And the question is, would you be able to identify within you if you have any of those leadership gifts? We want to do that tonight. Can you see within you that any of those gifts that God has given to you to impart to others? Because every time you impart to another, you are functioning as a leader. Yeah? Alison? As long as you are imparting to another, you are functioning in the position as a leader. If you are imparting to your children, if you are imparting to your work colleagues, if you are imparting to your husband, you are functioning as a leader. So let us look at the leadership gifts in the church. 
I, I was meditating upon this earlier, and uh, I love the revelation that God gave to me concerning this text here. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, he says, And he gave some, these are the gifts, apostles, apostles. Now notice it, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. So some are given as apostles. What is a, an apostle? An apostle is one saint. Now notice that in order to be an apostle, you must have what? What must you have? The apostolic gift. But he gives some prophets. In order for you to be a prophet, you have the prophetic gift. He gives some evangelists. In order for you to be an evangelist, he gave, that means that you, therefore, must have the evangelistic gift. In order for you to be a pastor, you have to have the pastoral gift. Now, the thought is that he gave some apostles. Now, an apostle is a gift of God to the church. So God gives men and women the gift of apostleship and then gives that person to the church as a gift. So we receive, the individual receives the gift and then the person becomes a gift to the church. So listen very carefully. If you have not known it before, God has given to me, God has given me as a gift to you. Thank you very much, Michelle. <laughs> God has given me to you as a gift. I am a gift to you because he has given me the gift of apostleship. And therefore, in giving me that gift, he then turned around and gave me to you. He's given uh, Dr. Greenwich to you as a gift. Because he's given Dr. Greenwich the gift of the pastoral gift. And then he has given Dr. Greenwich to you as a gift. So each and every one of us, we are all a gift to the church. But you can identify your gift that God has given to you. And when you identify that gift, then he gives you to the church. Isn't that wonderful? So you are a gift. Sister Leach, you are a gift to the church. Praise the Lord. Amen. And why does he give the gifts? And why does he give individuals as gifts to the church? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in unity of the faith and of, and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth would be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, but doing what? Speaking the truth in love. Before you can speak the truth, you must have love. When you speak the truth without love, it comes across in such a way that it cuts, it hurts, it kills. But when you speak the truth in love, people would recognize that you are looking out only for their benefit and uh, they would more give in to that because it is a double-edged sword. Cuts and it heals. Give it the truth in love. Not love for yourself, but love for the other. I love you and therefore I'm going to tell you what the truth really is. Given the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So both men and women are called, are given the, the gifts, the leadership gifts in the church. We are all have, we all have that opportunity to be, can a woman be an apostle? What do you think? If the, pardon? The gifts are given to men. The gifts are given to humanity. So a man, a woman can be an apostle. Can a woman be a prophet? Yes. Can a woman be an evangelist? Yes. Can a woman be a pastor? Yes. Why? Because God does not discriminate where the gifts are concerned. So you can identify every single woman that has children, every woman that has children, they have the opportunity to nurture the pastoral gift that is within them because that is what a pastor does. Sister 
Sister Michelle. Pardon? Uh, use the mic. I, I can't hear you very well. I did hear you say elder, so that's why I'm saying elder too, because I know that there are seven elders in the Bible, but among Reformation, we have not seen, or deacons, sorry, we have not seen female elders, and it's okay to have female elders too. Right, so the thought is, these are the gifts of the Spirit, but when you look at first, and we are not really doing a study on it, but in First Timothy chapter 3, the... The offices of the church, where you have uh, the bishop, which is the elder, bishop and deacons, those are gender-based. And uh, therefore, I don't see in the word where you have a female elder, a female deacon. I see in the word where you can have a female prophet, where you can have a female apostle, where you can have a female pastor. Because you are functioning in a gift, it is not an office. And that is what has happened in the Seventh-day Adventist world. They have taken the gift, made it an office, and therefore they say that women cannot be pastors. But the reality is, women, like men, can have the pastoral gift. So don't let any person cause you to believe that because you are a woman, you cannot be a pastor. It does not mean that you can be ordained as a bishop, which is an elder, First Timothy chapter 3. But the thing is, because... Now, there are, things, there, there are positions that women cannot hold and there are positions that men cannot hold. Can a woman be a husband? A woman cannot be a husband. So just because she cannot be a husband, well, these days, you know, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 trying, they're, they're trying to turn things upside down. People are trying to turn things upside down. But the reality is, the facts are that women cannot be husbands and the facts are that God has ordained that the male be the head of the home, and he has also ordained that the males function as the heads under Christ in the church, setting the example to the females in relation to godliness. Therefore, it is important for us to understand the difference between a pastor and an elder. A pastor does not have to be an elder. There are many men who, are, who have a pastoral gift, and they have never been ordained to be elders. But having a pastoral gift does not mean that, or not having, okay, but having a pastoral gift does not mean that you cannot function as a pastor because you're not ordained. You can teach, you can preach, you can nurture, you can uh, succor, that's the work of a pastor. You can lead individuals in to the pastor, you can feed them. That is the role of the pastor. Every time you're doing that role, you're doing the role of a pastor. You don't have to be ordained to be a pastor. You have to, be, you have to receive the gift of uh, the spirit, the pastoral gift to function as a pastor. And uh, I can tell you that there are many people, there are many men who probably have received the laying on of hands in ordination and don't have the pastoral gift. They, they don't nurture. They don't care for the sheep. They drive them uh, like cattle. And therefore, you have hirelings in the cause of God. So God desires for the church to be perfect. He desires for the church to be perfected, and that is why he has given gifts to all of us. And uh, you, may ask, you may say, wow, the fact is that I want to know what my gift is. I want to be able to function within the context of my gift. That is what we are talking about so that you would know how to do effective Bible studies. And I like this statement here, CEV 16, paragraph 1, in the, the, the place that is highlighted. It says, it is, it is the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit of God that prepares workers, both men and women, to become what? Pastors to the flock of God. Both men and women. So, Alison... You can have the pastoral gift. As you are working with your, your young people, you are functioning as a pastor. You are nurturing them. As Sister Leach is functioning with the little children, you are functioning as a pastor. You are nurturing them. So regardless of whoever the people may be, whatever work you're doing, once you're doing the work with people and you're nurturing them, if you're sitting with a person and giving them a Bible study, in nurturing them, in training them, in equipping them, you are functioning as a pastor. That's the pastoral gift. So this work then, 
must go not merely by declaration, it must be by a demonstration. We have to have, you know, Jesus made a statement in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. He says, the gospel must go as a witness. You can go and speak, but listen, we can make shipwreck of, our, of the faith of others if we go and try to teach them and we don't have the spirit of God. If you don't have the spirit of love and you go to teach, you, you, you find that sometimes we go canvassing and we knock on doors and we get into ah, heated arguments with people. We are not going to try to win an argument. We are trying to win souls to Jesus Christ. So it is not trying to let a person know how much you know. When you come, you come to nurture. You come to share. You come with the spirit of Christ. You knock on a door and you let the person know, I am here for you. You can even uh, try to help them in some way, but you can have the pastoral gift as you are doing that work. And uh, I like this statement that says, people really do not care about how much you know. Yeah? Until they know how much you care. You like that? Alison? People don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. So Christ demonstrated how much he cared before he was able to sit down and give a person, that woman by the well, a Bible study. We have to have a caring heart. And Paul demonstrated this to the Thessalonians when he said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your elect of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you. So Paul says that he came to demonstrate the gospel, not just for the purpose of declaring it with words. In our high calling, righteous words, and deeds have a more powerful influence for good than all the sermons that can be preached. I like that. In the home, what are our words like? Righteous words and deeds, they are more powerful than, and have more influence than the words that we speak. So again, do not Prepare a Bible study to give. Prepare a Bible study to live. Yes? When you are in the, your closet and you're preparing, preparing that Bible study to live it to others. Our focus usually is shifted from what it ought to be because we focus on preparing a Bible study to give to others rather than allowing our Bible study to prepare us to live with others. That is what God wants. He wants for the Bible study to first resonate in our own hearts. And then it can flow out as a testimony. So with that said, we're going to look at some keys. And we're going to run through them because you know these. We had gone through them before. Let us look at some keys for study. We are told in 2 Timothy again, chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by what? inspiration so all scripture is given by inspiration of god but though it is given by inspiration of god we are told in second peter chapter 3 verse 16 that there are some things that are hard to be understood mary have you, have you ever come across a passage of scripture that was hard to that was hard to understand yeah sister lishu yes Okay, <laughs> the whole book of Ezekiel. <laughs> yes. So, so there are certain things, and uh, Dr. Greenwich, you, you have a mandate to teach the congregation Ezekiel. So, so, so there are certain things that are hard to be understood in Scripture. I came across some passages, man, that had me scratching my head. And therefore, what we need to do when we get to these passages, we don't just go over them. We have to now, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, compare spiritual things with spiritual, search and pray and agonize and ask the Lord, teach me these things. I like this statement in Christ's Object Lessons, page 111, paragraph 2. It says, it is essential for old and young not only to read 
God's word, Sister Mary, not only to read God's word, but to study it wholeheartedly with wholehearted earnestness, praying and searching for truth as for hidden treasure. So, in our preparation of our Bible studies, let us spend time in agonizing, earnest prayer as we pour over one passage of scripture, seeking to get the juice out of it. All right? So what we're going to do right now is to turn to a series of texts that are very familiar to you. That, and this is an easy line, and then we're going to go to a more difficult one. I know that it's easy to, for you, and therefore, we're going to go through it quickly. In looking at the humanity of Christ, let us link it quickly. We are, now, when you are studying a topic, you are studying topical, you know, or when you get a scripture, and you look at the scripture, you need to pull out of that scripture that which it is speaking in reference to your topic. For example, in looking at the humanity of Christ, what is the first scripture that we usually start with? Romans 1, 3. And it says, concerning his son, speaking about his son, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, it says that Christ was of the seed of David according to the flesh. Was he of the seed of David according to the spirit? So you notice what I just did there? I ask a question that would bring a negative so that I can bring you to a positive. If he had not been of the seed of David according to the spirit, then it means that the scripture here is correct. It is only according to the flesh. The scripture says, not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. This means, and this, and this is a question that you can ask. So you have to ask questions when you're looking at scripture. What type of flesh did David have? That is the answer, sinful flesh. This therefore means if David had sinful flesh and Christ was made of the seed of David according to flesh, it therefore means that Christ had sinful flesh. That is how you study. So you are going to pull from the text what you want to understand. So you can ask the question, what is the next question that you can ask? That would link you to another text. It would, this, you're not going to link. You want to know, build on it. Christ had sinful flesh. But a question that can be asked is this. Why? Is that a fair question? Why was it necessary for him to have sinful flesh? Why? But when you ask that question, you don't have to have another scripture to answer the question. You don't answer the question because you have to now preempt what a person may be asking you and think about what the answer will be and have a scripture to supply the answer. So why was it necessary for Christ to have sinful flesh? That has now linked you to another scripture. And the next scripture is Romans 8.3. Romans 8.3. For what the Lord could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God said in his own son, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. The, answer, the question that you are going to ask the person here is this. Based upon Romans 8.3, then, what was the reason, why was it necessary for Christ to take sinful flesh? You're leading the mind now. Based upon Romans 8.3, why was it necessary for Christ to take sinful flesh? What's the answer? The answer is in the text. No, the answer is right here in this text. Based upon Romans 8.3, then, why was it necessary for Christ to take sinful flesh? To condemn sin in the flesh. That is what the scripture says. You don't go outside of the scripture. So you have to get the answer from the scripture. You don't impose fraudulently into a scripture what is not there. So all, this, all Romans 1, 8, 3 says is that it was necessary for Christ to take sinful flesh because he had to condemn sin in the flesh. So he had to come in the same flesh that sin was in. Another reason, this is now we're going to link now to another. There is another reason why Christ had to take sinful flesh. That now will take you to another text. You are linking it now to the next text. What is the other reason? Give me a text. Hebrews 2, 14. For as much then as the children are what? Partakers of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise a part of, part of the same. That through death 
he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. From Hebrews 2.14 then, what is the other reason why Christ had to taste of flesh? From Hebrews 2.14. That he might destroy him that had the power of death. But how only could he have destroyed him that had the power of death? It is right there. By dying that through death he might destroy. Yes? So notice that we are getting our answers from the text as you link them. So what was the first reason we mentioned that Christ had to take sinful flesh? First reason? Romans 8, 3. To do what? Condemn sin in the flesh. And what is the second reason why Christ had to take sin for flesh? So that he can die in order to destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He could not have died if he did not have sinful. But in having sinful flesh, he was able to die. Now, look how I'm going to link it now. Now, since Christ had sinful flesh, he was able to condemn sin in the flesh, and he was able to die. Does this therefore mean... That he ever sinned because he had sinful flesh. The answer is no. This therefore will link us to what? What is the answer? Hebrews 4 verse 15. Very good. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. But was in what? All points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Could Christ have been tempted if he did not have our flesh? You didn't listen to that question. Could Christ have been tempted if he did not have our flesh? Yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> if he does not know it had to be yes, right? <laughs> Could Christ have been tempted if he did not have our flesh? Listen to the question carefully. Could Christ have been tempted if he did not have our flesh? Why do you say yes, Caitlin? You can't say yes. Merely, you got to say why. Pardon? Sister Leach? Yes? Adam was not in sinful flesh and Adam was tempted. Yes? So you don't have to be in sinful flesh in order to be tempted. Where the angels were not in sinful flesh and the angels were tempted. But it did not say he was just tempted. What does it say? He was in all points tempted like as we are. Yeah? So could Christ have been tempted in all points like as we are without having sinful flesh? No. That is a reason why he also had to take our sinful flesh to be tempted in all points like as we are. And yet he overcame, yet he was not, he did not sin. So, so, was Christ tempted in everything that I was tempted in, Kelly? In everything that I'm tempted in, was Christ tempted in? Everything. Everything. Not everything. I know. <laughs> you caught yourself. That is very good. So, so, so you have to, we have to train our minds to listen to what is being asked and don't put a meaning to what is being asked. Seek to understand what a person is asking. When you are out there in the field, people are going to ask you things, and sometimes they ask you things that you answer something completely different. You have to listen carefully to what is being asked so that you can give the appropriate answer. Do not put your meaning to what people are asking. He was tempted in all points. What are the three points in which we are tempted? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. These are the points. So every Every sin falls into one of those categories. And he was tempted in all those categories, all three of those categories, therefore he can succor me. And uh, since, he was, since he was tempted in all points, like as I am tempted, and he overcame, notice the word I just used. How would I finish off this Bible study? Since he was tempted in all points, like as I am tempted, and he overcame, what does this therefore mean? That I too can overcome. What is the text that we're going to finish off with? Revelation 3, 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even also as I overcame, and I'm sat down with my father in his throne. Okay. So that is a very easy line. And uh, 
we are now going to reflect a little bit on a more difficult one. This is one that is fairly, this is a fairly difficult text of scripture. Let us read it here. First Peter chapter 3 verses 18 to 20. For Christ also have once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirit in prisons. Which sometimes were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, rain few that his eight souls were saved by water. Is that a difficult one or an easy one? What will you say? You don't understand it. <laughs> Caitlin, listen carefully. It says Christ was once offered for the sins, and then he, it was quickened in spirit, but then it says here, by which. Also, he went. Who went? Who is he speaking about? Christ went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So it is suggesting to our mind that when Christ died, he went and preached to dead spirits in prison. Because the prison would have been a grave. Because notice what it says, which sometimes were disobedient, when was the long suffering of God waiting in the days of Noah. So who are the spirits that he preached to? Who are the spirits here that he preached to? The people before the flood. So the context here is, Peter is saying that he went and preached to dead spirits when he died who lived before the flood. Is that a di Anybody ever saw that scripture before? Yeah, you saw that scripture before, Cecily? You understand what he's what saying? You understand what he's saying. Uh, you saw it before, Sister Mary? Tell the truth. <laughs> Sister Kelly, you understand what this is saying? But people interpret it so... People, I, I had a discussion, but, but it says, by which he, Christ, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Christ. So how then will we tackle a scripture like this? What is the first thing that we would have to do in tackling a scripture like this? It would suggest that Christ died, and when he died, he went and preached to dead spirits who were who, of people who were living before the flood. That's how people interpret it. And if you look at it at face value, that is what it would be saying. At face value. So in tackling a scripture like this, you have to ask questions. You can't take a scripture just by itself. What you therefore have to do is now to bring other scriptures to bear upon it. How would you tackle it? You obviously got to start with the state of the dead. All right? That's obvious. So you come to a person, they are reading this, and you're going to say, okay, let us look at a scripture that is suggesting what happens to those who die. Who die? Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4. It says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth. He returneth to his earth. In that day his thoughts perish. What do you understand by that? In that day his thoughts perish. Now, there's a possibility. You can look at a different translation. And it can say, in that day his plans come to an end. Yeah? In that day, his plans come to an end. So, it is not necessarily saying that he ceased to think. It can be saying that the plans he had is no more, even though he continues to think. Yeah? Is that a way of interpreting that? That is a way of interpreting it. Because there's another translation that says, in that day, his plans come to an end. Okay. So we are therefore going to have to go to a different text to start building upon it. Let us see 
This as it says that the dead know not anything. This is a, now a stronger text. So when you are now doing your Bible study, you're going to go from strength to strength. So you're going to come with a weaker text. And when a person sees the weaker text, you're going to uh, explain that weaker text. Okay, in that day his thoughts perish, but some may say his plans come to an end. But let us now look at now another text in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Let us see what that says. For the living know that they should die, but the dead know not anything. Aha, uh -huh. so that is even stronger. It says, neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. When it says the memory of them is forgotten, they, it can be saying that those people on the earth have forgotten them. So the memory of who they are is forgotten. But it goes on in verse 6 to say, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. In Psalm 146, it says, their thoughts perish. But now in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 6, it says that their emotions perish. You get that? I'm going to come to you now, sweetheart. Notice this. First in Psalm 146, their thoughts perish. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 6, their emotions perish. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done where? Under the sun. So their thoughts perish. And the emotions perish under the sun, but it does not mean that they cannot be under the earth. So under the sun, they cannot be alive, but they can be living under the earth. No, I, I am saying what people can say. So you have to think about what people can come with. Correct? When you're doing your Bible study. So it is a strong text, but people can still wiggle a little bit. There's still some wiggling room because it says, because it ended with, there's nothing, no portion forever in anything done under the sun. Well, well in the grave, some people go on to hell and some people go on to heaven, correct. So, so under the sun, there's some people who are in heaven, right? And they're in heaven having a wonderful time. And there's some people in hell having not so wonderful a time. But they're still alive. But... And therefore, it has destroyed the whole tenor of the text itself because it says that the dead know not anything. But then when it says forever done under the sun, it means, they can say it means the dead know not anything under the sun. So we therefore can go a little further and bring another text. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 18. It says, for the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. All right. So notice this text now is telling us something very interesting. It says, those who go down into the grave, that is into the pit, they cannot have any hope for truth. They cannot receive any truth. So God cannot communicate with them while they're in the pit. They cannot hear anything. They cannot. They're, so Isaiah was right. Their love, their envy, their hatred, it is all gone. And notice that you praise with your will. You choose to praise God. And uh, your thoughts perish. Your emotions perish. And your will is perish also. You don't have the capability of praising God. Your entire being has come to a point where you cannot serve God. And he says, they that go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. He says, verse 19, the living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day, the father to the children that make known thy truth. So notice that it is the living, whether it is in heaven or on earth, it is only the living that can praise God. If you are dead, you can't praise God. So there's no way that they can wiggle around this. As a matter of fact, I look at it at, at verse 18 at the contemporary English version. So I may be going fairly quickly for time, Sister Kelly, but at least it's being recorded and you can go over it and pause it and sift through it. All right? So notice in verse 18, it says, No, this is the contemporary English version. No one in the world of the dead can thank you or praise you. So he refers to it as the world of the dead. When you are in the world of the dead, it is impossible for there to be any praises. You can't praise God when you are dead. 
And notice, notice what he says now. And this is going to link us right back to the first text in 1 Peter chapter 3 from verse 18. None of those in the deep pit can hope for you to show them how faithful you are. Now, remember in 1 Peter chapter 3, it is being suggested that he went and preached unto the spirits that were in prison. But it says here that it is impossible for any person who has died to hope for any word of your faithfulness. So therefore, going back to the text then, you have to say there must be some other meaning. It cannot mean what it seemingly suggests. It cannot mean that he personally went and teach and preach to those dead people in, that were dead, that are dead, who lived before the flood. The question is now, as we come down to our close, just quickly, how therefore would we tackle it? How would we tackle it? Notice now I have some highlights. And you are now going to look at the complete text. It says, for Christ, verse 18, also has what? What is a, a very important word there? Wants. That is the word. That is the word. Christ has also wants. That is the word. Why is that word so important? Wants suffered for sins. Why would I stress that? Why would I stress that? Christ once suffered for sin. You are now seeking to extrapolate and uh, from this text what it really means. Try to interpret it. Why would I focus on once suffered for sins? A one thought. Give me a thought. Pardon me? It's already passed. What is already passed? Pardon me? Christ dying for our sins, true. So what has that have to do with the text? In understanding the text. Remember, in giving the meaning, it, it must be relative to what you are seeking to bring out where the text is concerned. Pardon me? It was not something he did not have to die over and over, and we're going to see that that is true. Why is it necessary? Why is it important for us to stress it? Notice, he once suffered for sins. Okay, let me ask you a question. Pardon? Pass. So he once suffered for the sins of who? All men. Pass. Those who are pre-flood. Those who are pre-cross. Those who are post-cross. He once, once suffered for the sins of all men who have ever lived and who will ever live. Why is that important? Once you can bring this out, then you can start building a foundation as to what is meant by he went and preached unto them who were in prison. He, did he die for those who were living before the flood? When did he die for them? All right, so when did he die for them? 4,000 years afterwards. He actually died for them 4,000 years afterwards, actually. But when was the promise given that he will die and it was activated when? From the foundation of the earth, there was the covenant. And then as soon as man sinned, the covenant was activated. And in Genesis 3.15, it was declared. All right? But it was ratified at the cross. So Christ's work, therefore, on the cross... Therefore, it is predated, retroactive. It goes right back. So all that the people before the flood experience is exactly what Christ did for them on the cross of Calvary. But Christ would not have, it would not have said that he went and preached unto them unless he came and ratified it. So as soon as he died, so I want us to note something here before I say this. For Christ also have once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Notice it now. Another clue. Being put to what? Death in the flesh, but what? Quickened by the Spirit. So notice this is something very significant. His death and his resurrection. These are two things. People focus on his death and think that he went and communicated when he died. But that is not what it is saying. 
it says that by his death and by his resurrection, by which both death and resurrection, he then went and speak. So it was not when he died, it was his death and resurrection, and it was by that he went and speak to spirits in, who were in prison. You follow that? So before he could have actually speak to the spirit in dead that were in prison, he had to both die and be resurrected. Simon, you get that? So it was both by his death and by his resurrection, and, then it, and therefore it says, then it says, by which? Then it says, by which? By his death and by his resurrection, he went and preached unto them, uh, the spirits that were in prison. Kelly, your forward, forward is foreign. You are not getting it? Let me go again. L listen again. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit. Those are two things that are mentioned. People focus on the fact that he was put to death. And, when, and they say that when he was put to death, he went and preached to spirits in prison. He went and preached to the dead spirits or the dead people, the spirits of dead people who were in prison, who had rejected him, and he gave them the opportunity to receive salvation. So he went and preached to them. But the scriptures is not saying this. The scripture says, being put to death in flesh, but quickened in spirit. Two things are mentioned. So his death and his quickened by the spirit. So his death and his resurrection together compose that which, when he says, by which, these two words, by which, by which also he went, by which, so notice it was by his death and quickened by the Spirit, those who combine constitute him going and preaching to those who were in prison. He did not go and preach to them in prison when he died. He preached to them who were in prison when he died and rose. But, but right, so, so the thing is, when, not, not prison, prison in terms of uh, being put in jail, but the prison is in the grave. All right? Those who have already died. The prison there is, uh, you know, even in Isaiah talk about those who are put in the bars. So that is in the grave, in the pit. So those who are in the grave, they then uh, he was able to preach to them by his death and his resurrection. The question is now, what does that mean? That's the first thing that you have to disseminate. You have to disseminate the thought that it was by his death merely that he preached to them. You have to show that it was by his death and resurrection that he preached to them. You follow that, Kelly? No, you, you see, we first, we first establish, and, uh, and when you're given a Bible study, you have to take one step at a time. The very first step is proving that he did know not anything. Now you're making another step. The next step is one suffered. So one suffered means that he died for the sins for all men for all time. That means that his sin covered those who were before the flood. Secondly, he spoke about death and resurrection. It is not that when he died, he in death, that he himself, because it is said that when he died, his spirit was still alive, and his spirit went and speak to the dead spirits in, who were in the grave, right? Or lock up wherever they were, and he preached to them. But it is being proven here that it was not his death. It was by death and resurrection that he preached. You didn't get to the spirits yet. So you're walking first by the death and resurrection, not just by the death. So he could not have in death gone and preached. He had to have waited until he was resurrected to go and preach. Because they are saying when he died as a spirit, he went and preached. But it had to have been after he was resurrected, then he preached. So it was by his death and resurrection that he preached. You're getting the point. That is important. So the question now is, what does it mean that he preached to the spirits? That is now the point. By his death and resurrection. You see that? That is the point now that we are to, and that is what we are going to close with. That we are going to close with the fact 
that it was by his death and resurrection that he preached to those before the flood. Yes? Say money with me. You're processing. The fact is that it is by his death and resurrection when he actually died and rose again, he preached to them who lived before the flood. Let us see how he did it. And it's very, very simple. Very, pardon? The ratification of that which... All right. So Christ predates the flood. You know, we look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. But notice this now. It says, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 17. For a testament is of force after men are what? Dead. So when the testament began, when did it when the will was the will written? When was the will written? When was the testament? From the foundation of the earth. And uh, it, therefore, as soon as man sinned, he was receiving the benefits of the will. Yes? What was in the will? What was in the will? Pardon? The correct, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, what was being preached to those before the flood? The death and the resurrection of Christ. Yes? So, he preached to them through who? Well, you know, it says here, this statement goes on to speak about um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. It says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are a figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should suffer himself, offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But he had to only do it once. But when he did it, it was retroactive. Let us see something here. Salvation or redemption was a once and uh, for all thing that as soon as man sinned, it was implemented, it was activated, and therefore every single individual before the flood was able to receive the gospel of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who preached that gospel? Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4. For if the God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down into hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a what? A preacher of righteousness. So when did Christ preach to those before the flood? Pardon? Before the flood through Noah. And he ratified Noah's preaching by his death. You get it? So that is how he went and preached to them. Because he gave the same message through Noah to those men about the death, his death. Because Noah went through the flood which had to do with the baptism. And therefore he was emerged. He was saved by death. But notice Enoch. Watch Enoch. Jude 1, 14, 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. But can he come unless he was resurrected? So Enoch preached the resurrection and the coming of Jesus Christ in glory. So before the flood, Christ preached to those who were there about his death, about his resurrection, and about his intercession, and about his coming, so that they would also be saved. And he ratified it on the cross of Calvary. That is how he went and preached to them. That is how we do a Bible study.